supply of handouts? There's a, there's oh. a lot. I think we're still ready. Good evening, and welcome to the Core Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist. I'm Ulrike McGregor, and I'm delighted <coughs> to see you all here for our second session of Reflections on Advent and Christmas through Art. The reoccurring theme throughout our reflection this evening comes from Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. As heard in our first reading last Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, which Father Mann also referred to in his homily. I quote, Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. If we are all clay, and then God, through his hands, has infinite possibilities in the creation of our individual human characteristics. As clay, we are not stuck in a fixed mold, but we can be adjusted or adjust. We can be improved or improve, or be reformed all over again. I believe this quote from Isaiah will resonate with tonight's three works of art in one way or another as we reflect on them. Our first painting is by the British poet, printmaker, and painter William Blake. It is entitled, The Angel Appearing to Zacharias and was painted in 1800 during the age of romanticism. Roman, romanticism. Our second work of art is a beautiful white glazed terracotta sculpture by Luca della Rubia, representing the visitation. It was produced around 1445 in Florence at the beginning of the Renaissance. Over here. The last work of art of this evening is the painting, The Birth of St. John the Baptist by the Spanish painter, Bartolomeo Esteban Murillo. It was created circa 1655 during the Baroque period. All three works of art of this evening 
are closely related to the gospel readings by Luke, which, which, we, which we will hear during the third week of Advent. I would like to start tonight's reflection with a definition of clay and a brief history of the use of clay for the modeling of sculptures. Naturally, this introduction into sculpting in clay will be incomplete since we will cover more than 25,000 years in history. And I will start with a definition from the sciencelearninghub.org, what is clay? Clay is a soft, loose, earthy material containing particles with a grain size of less than four micrometers. It forms as a result of the weathering and erosion of rocks containing the mineral group feldspar, known as the mother of clay, over vast spans of time. During weathering, the feldspar content is altered by hydrolysis, so reaction with water, to form clay minerals. And that was just the scientist in me, <laughs> to just make clear what is clay. <clears throat> clay, as its products come in different stages, and our each stage is named differently. And this is just a quick overview of the seven common stages of clay. Clay is known after firing in a kiln, which is a special oven, as bisquare or terracotta. The Italian term for baked or fired earth. Sculpting in clay is inexpensive and results in versatile versatile, light and durable objects. <coughs> and clay can be is the soft part, the wet clay, and it can be formed in ent into any shape. It needs to then be really dry before it's fired for the first time. After the firing of the first time, it's, you can use it, we can think of terracotta pots, but it it will let through water, so it's porous. And then only the last step, when it's glazed and then fired again, it will be waterproof. And so we will talk about glazing and um, firing a couple of times throughout the talk. Are there actually any potters in the room? Does anyone potter? Do potter? Oh, a little bit. I always think when I learned about this, it's all confusing, but once you do it, it actually falls into place, doesn't it? It kind of seems to make sense. And sorry for the images are not the greatest. Sculpting in clay dates to the Paleolithic era, era of the Stone Age, roughly 2.5 million years ago to 10,000 BC. The earliest known clay sculpture the one over here is the Venus of Dolni Vestonic, a ceramic figurine dating circa 20,000 years BC, and it was discovered in the Czech Republic. Another Paleolithic masterpiece is the Tuck du Berat Bison from circa 13,500 BC which is an unfired relief of two bison found in a cave in France. A third prehistoric masterpiece is the thinker of Sana Voda. It's the one over here, it's unfortunately very dark. This iconic terracotta figurine was created circa 5000 BC in Romania. Today, the most famous example of, of clay sculpture must be the Chinese Qin Dynasty Terracotta Army, also known as the Terracotta Warriors. A collection of 8,000 clay warriors and horses unearthed in 1974 in Shaanxi province in China. 
dating to 246 to 2008, 208 BC, each of the 8,000 clay soldiers is unique with a different facial expression and hairstyle. So they were all, they weren't, it wasn't one mold and they would just replicate them. They were all um, at least somewhat modified by hand, even each of them, each individually. Following the collapse of the Roman Empire, circa 450 AD, the use of terracotta declined dramatically until it was revived as an artistic medium in the early Renaissance. Renaissance sculptors rediscovered the potential of terracotta for making images of Christian art, notably that of the Virgin Mary and child. Before long, clay was being modeled to replicate devotional images and other figures, which were fired, painted, and gilded, thus creating a low-cost alternative to more expensive materials like marble and bronze. Members of the Della Rubia family, such as Luca and Andrea, popularized the use of glazed terracotta for interior and exterior relief sculpture and church altarpieces, as you can see here on this slide. So these were private devotional pieces. These were implemented on the outside of buildings, and these were parts of a, an altarpiece. A glaze is a glass-like substance fused onto the surface of terracotta to form a waterproof decorative coating. De La Rubia's works were particularly praised as new, useful, and most beautiful. Their distinctive technique involved the application of colorful glazes to sculptures, mostly heavenly blue, rich hues of greens, and yellow. I will return and introduce Luca della Rubia in more detail when we reflect on our second work of this evening. With this short introduction into the world of clay sculptures, we will now start to explore this evening's first work of art. And you have the image also on your handout. And once I start introducing the artist, it's very close to what I read, and sometimes it's helpful for people to follow along on the text, or you can just listen to me. Our first work is The Angel Appearing to Zacharias. Painted in 1799 and 1800 by William Blake. William Blake was born in 1757 and died in 1827 in London. He was an English painter, poet, and printmaker, whose work is categorized as part of the Romantic movement. Blake is now considered a true pioneer and visioneer poet and artist, but he was largely unrecognized during his own lifetime. It took years before historians and critics discovered the importance of his work on the development of printmaking and fine art painting. Blake, to see the, last, the least, a complex and multifaceted person, was a committed Christian, and the Bible would remain a source of lifelong inspiration to him. Considered from any point of view, Blake, an anti-establishment contrarian, is one of the most interesting and extraordinary figures in the history of English painting. Blake was artistically highly gifted. He entered a drawing school in London at the age of 10, was writing poetry at the age of 12, and would go on to produce some of the finest lyrical poetry in the English language. Besides poetry, in 1772, Blake began an apprenticeship for seven years 
to the successful engraver James Bazir. In 1779, Blake was admitted to the Royal Academy of Art and first exhibited there in 1780. His visual art, created mostly through relief etching, intaglio engraving, tempera, and watercolor, usually featured biblical imagery, Greek mythology, or literary illusions. Blake is known for a high degree of experimentation and a body of work that is difficult to classify or categorize. Prizing the imagination above all else, claiming it to be the pinnacle of human existence. One of Blake's most famous, popular, and durable poetic works, now known as Jerusalem, was a prologue to his 1810 poem, Milton, a poem in two books. The poem was inspired by the legend that Jesus had traveled with Joseph of Arimathea to England. In 1916, Jerusalem was included as a patriotic poem in the collection for Country at War. It was simultaneously set to music by Sir Hubert Perry. The song Jerusalem usually performed in the arrangement that Edward Elgar wrote in 1922 remains a musical staple at many events in England and is now considered to be the alternative English national anthem. I don't know if you had the experience also, if you go to um, big events in London, uh, they will play Jerusalem at the very beginning and they will wave the Union, the Union Jack at the same time. As you consider tonight's first painting, I would like to quote from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 12, 13, and 20. And I quote, When Zacharias saw the angel, he was terrified. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son, and you will name him John. But now, because you did not believe my words, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur." End of quote. And with all the talking that I did for the first <laughs> 15 minutes, I just invite everyone here to um, express what they see. Um, or what, how they interpret, or what they feel about the painting. Um, who are the figures? <laughs> sure, Michael. <laughs> okay, I was an altar server, and the first thing I noticed is that the priest Zachariah, Zacharias, is holding. The, I can't remember if it's the thurible or thurifer. I can't remember which is which, but. He's holding it all wrong. He is agog, and he's dropped his arm, and that thing is almost against his robe, and you never do that. It's, you know, it's flaming. So he's taken aback by the appearance of the angel. You know, he's, he's dropped his guard. He's not thinking about what he's doing. He's focused on the angel, and the angel saw it and said, don't be afraid, <laughs> but they often say that, but, you know. Oh, I think it well, must be, it's probably quite the experience. I mean, I think we yeah, <laughs> all would be, but... That's, that's just a first. Yes, yeah, beautiful start. I'm scratching my head as to what the figure is in between the two. Yes, yeah, so I would say, I, I think it's more instant. Um, so it's just uh, an open area where they just burn a lot of the oh, okay. incense. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, he's holding the the little incense burner, um, but I think there's a maybe a bit of like an altar where they where they burn a lot of it. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. 
It could be the spirit, Holy Spirit or the Spirit of the Lord in the middle of that. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, we are open for any suggestions. Um, just kind of, um, Zacharias is Hebrew for God has remembered. And I think that leads, is, is very interesting because Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth were always promised to have countless descendant, but Elizabeth, they got on in age, and Elizabeth was known to be barren, and well, they hadn't had children, so I think that also plays on the name, so God will keep his promise, so he said they will have descendants, so there's nothing God can't do, so um, he, he made sure that Elizabeth could give birth. Um, and I kind of just get the, so again, um, one of my things that I like to do when I look at the work of art, in particular, a uh, work like this, I think again, we can read this from the left to the right. Um, I think one particular I interesting thing is in the scripture, it says, um, the angel Gabriel appeared on the right hand side. And I think that becomes important as we kind of work our way through the painting. Um, so just, so we are on the far left, and this is, we have a menorah, um, which is a, a symbol for Judaism. Um, because Zacharias, he was a, a Jewish priest, as much as his wife was. She was, a, I was coming from a priest family. So I think um, Blake included that to, to make sure we know where we are. Right, even if we wouldn't necessarily all know all the details of the reading. And then there's Zacharias. And I agree, I think that's, a, so he, he's really stunned. I mean, his, his um, eyes are wide open. Yeah, he, he dropped everything. He, wasn't, he's, he doesn't quite um, remember what he was probably doing. Um, and then we go further on and we come to the angel. And if we remember where we find the reading of Luke, it's Luke chapter one. So it's the very beginning of the New Testament. And I think this reading is placed there to help us to work from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Um, and I think this is beautifully, you can beautifully see that, you can walk through the painting. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has any suggestions what this could be. I mean, I guess it's something the New Testament, maybe, I don't know. Um, maybe the New and the Old Testament as two books. I don't know, any, hmm. any ideas? <coughs> Yep. And then, uh, anyone? Have, uh, so I was quite struck when I looked at the angel a little bit more in detail. So we see his hand here. And does anyone, if you kind of have we seen this before in any works of art? Yeah. So this is very typical, it's, which is kind of interesting. So it's, I think it's a play a little bit. So it's the angel Gabriel, but he uses the hand movement that's very typical to, for John the Baptist. And there's a, a beautiful painting, again, it's very dark, um, by Leonardo da Vinci, where he kind of, he uses exactly the same point, the finger point, which is beautiful. Um, and of course, Blake was familiar with the painting, so. Um, That's kind of an androgynous angel, so, so I like it. Excuse me? <laughs> That's an, an androgynous angel, so I like it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's important to some. Um, and then also, again, I think Blake, 
made multiple references in his angel to actually John the Baptist. Um, he's also holding the little cross, which in many paintings we have seen um, John the Baptist holding, which is the, li the little cross made out of reeds. Uh, so I think, again, it's kind of a double play. It's, it's the angel announcing the birth of St. John the Baptist, but it's implementing many features that we will see later um, associated with John the Baptist. Um, As you go on and talk about the, um, the Old and the New Testament and how it moves from one to the other, um, and what Zechariah represents is, is somewhat the law of the, Juda the Judaic people at the time as a priest. And so those two pieces on the side could well represent, I think of the transfiguration, the, the law and the prophets, because of John the Baptist being really one of the final prophets leading to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's it. I just have a question. Why, why do you think um, Zacharias is in, kind of in the light and the angel in the dark, which is a bit, to me, a bit surprising because an angel, to me, is something pretty luminous, a pretty... Uh, it kind of should be the light of the picture. So I, I find it interesting to see that, I mean, it's maybe to, for us to focus on Ze Zacharias, but to have an angel that's not that um, light, I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, My, yeah. bright, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think there are m two or multiple answers to that. I think in general, uh, Blake, particularly in this painting, used a very muted palette color palette, which is kind of, again, doubles play, muted, so Zacharias being muted. Um, in, but he also liked to use this set of colors. He probably, yeah, he wouldn't necessarily use a white um, in, his, in his works. Uh, and I think the main light source is kind of, kind of a heavenly glow uh, coming from from above. Yeah. Thank you. So I I appreciate Mary's uh, awareness about the containers on the right, about the kind of bridging with the prophets and all. But before she spoke, and I think she's more right than I am in a sense. But we know we can all offer. I was wondering if there, if it's not oil, like anointing oh, okay. containers of oil, which is to anoint the past and the future, <laughs> along with Mary's piece, actually, prophets, and there was always anointings when mm -hmm. there was something like we do in baptism and confirmation, ordination. So this experience of John the Baptist coming to anoint, to give life. Yeah, and that's beautiful. It's exactly because there, there is no correct answers, and, and I couldn't even quite figure it out. So I, I appreciate both of the, the potential um, interpretations. Yes. I have to let my inner weirdo out, but am I the only one when I see? I didn't see this as the back of the wing uh, of his other wing. I saw this as a face with two eyes and a nose. And <laughs> head <of> hair. <laughs> Who's looking over his shoulder? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not the only weirdo. <laughs> oh yeah, so I think this is it's the the tip of the the reed cross. But yeah, again, I mean it's it's funny as we, how we see things um, differently. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of, Blake has a lot of symbolism and mysticism, so. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. 
Ulrika, it's just, um, I just noticed it's nice that you started with this piece of art that is um, representative of Zacharias, who was a Hebrew leader, because tonight is the first night of Hanukkah. Ooh. So, and I noticed the candles. <laughs> first, Thank tonight you. is the first night of Hanukkah. Thank you. Sorry, I'd just like to comment that that's a seven, that, that is not a Hanukkah candlestick, actually. It doesn't have the right number of candles for Hanukkah, but that's the traditional um, temple, my understanding anyway, of, of um, candelabra that they used. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and just to actually pull all our observations together, kind of my um, summary would be the encounter of Zacharias, Zacharias with the angel Gabriel is cited at the very beginning of the New Testament as a transition from the Old Testament. Blake's painting translates this transition pictorially for us in a wonderful way through the use of a muted color palette. And I will leave you with this question. Again, it's my question. Will I have the strength to be silent in times when I want to retort? So there's much more we can discuss and explore in this painting, but I think it is time for us to move on to our second work of art of this evening. Our second work is the white glazed terracotta sculpture, The Visitation, by Luca della Rubia, created circa 1445. It is located in the church of San Giovanni Fuerivitas in Pistoia, near Florence. Luca della Rubia, born circa 1399 in Florence, was renowned for his innovation and in ongoing development of the application of colorful reflective glazes on clay sculptures. Initially, Luca worked as a sculptor in marble and his first documented commission was the singing gallery for Florence Cathedral in 1431. After 10 years working in marble and bronze, Luca began to experiment with the application of different glazes of paint-like coatings on fired clay, which was then bound to the clay through refiring. Over subsequent decades, using a light-colored, high-quality clay, which was readily available from the Arno River around Florence, Luca developed formula or recipes for glazed terracotta which became closely guarded workshop secrets. And even today, the recipes have not been revealed and even um, restorers can do chemical analysis and all kinds of technical measures, but they still have not found the recipe. The particular advantages of using humble clay for sculpting compared to marble or bronze were numerous. It's ready availability, low cost, resistance to damage from moisture and water, remarkable durability of the color glaze, and the ability to create interconnected figures as we see in the visitation, which is not easily done in marble. Luca's earliest documented works using this techniques are two lunettes, the Resurrection, 1445, and the Ascension, 1446, over the sacristy, sacristy door in Florence Cathedral. By covering the baked clay model with a hard glaze, his figures appeared bathed in light, the polished surface reflecting light and color. This technique made Luca's terracotta sculptures particularly beautiful, visible from a distance and very durable. Luca 
collaborated closely for many years with his nephew, Andrea, who had entered the workshop in 1451 and who inherited it in 1482. Five of Andrea's children joined the enterprise, carrying the family's art into the 16th century. As you consider our second work of art of this evening, I will quote from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 41 and 42. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And with this quote in mind, I again invite um, every one of you to share your, your thoughts. So I've worked in OB for many years, and I love this because if you've ever monitored a baby in utero, I've many times seen that child respond. Like I remember one night dad coming in after being gone for a while, and that baby leapt in the womb, and I had a hard time finding it for a little bit. It was so excited. <laughs> and, and I think the beauty of realizing, you know, what we as Catholics believe that from conception on, this is an, another life, and how it can react, and can you, you know, just the excitement of that baby reacting to the ultimate excitement, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so, made me think of that. <laughs> Thank you. So, why do you think did Luca decide to use all white since he had worked so hard <laughs> for the last 10 years to create the most wonderful colors. You look at their faces, you don't look at their... Excuse me? You look at the faces, you don't look at the color. You see their faces and their expressions and the form rather than the color. Yeah. That's what I would say. White implies purity, and so that conveys a sense of purity to the scene, you know. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, he definitely, um, I think both points are very important. He wanted to not distract the viewer through color, and we would say, oh, isn't that a beautiful blue? But we would miss looking into the, the beautiful young face. I mean, she's so young, Mary, um, such a young woman. Um, and then, in contrast, um, presenting Elizabeth at her older age, but still with, with grace um, and just beautiful. Um, mm. So this was made in 1445. Um, so, and Michelangelo might, because um, he, he grew up pretty close to Florence, I mean, 100, 100 miles away, and he may or he may not have seen it and might have s um, had his, the idea of representing Mary as a young woman, potentially from, from work uh, by, by Luca. Just the positioning of the two women, uh, you know, we typically think that the elder woman would be the one that is standing and the younger one would be the one that would uh, be lower, but you know, obviously different than this. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think what's also important besides looking at the faces, I think the interaction between the two is just so beautiful. Um, I mean, the embrace, if you, if you look at the hands, and I think I have another. Um, it's a beautiful embrace between the two women, and 
the, the way they look at each other, it's a beautiful gaze, it's an understanding gaze, it's an um, a, a appreciating gaze um, to each other. And even though clay is a humble material, is a cheaper material, but I think the way he made this sculpture is absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's so white. I mean, it's a dazzling white. And with the most beautiful marble, and I love marble sculptures, but it would be hard to kind of be able to um, create that, um, this, the whiteness of it and the, the clarity. Um, I think he, he worked beautifully with the, the drapery. Um, he generated beautiful drapery um, on, the, on the two figures. Mary. It, it's, it's sort of a interesting that uh, Elizabeth humbles herself before Mary and who Mary holds. And, and Mary's face looks with that pondering expression to the wisdom of Elizabeth at the same time. So they really are so deeply interconnected and so um, honoring of one another mm -hmm. and all that they carry together yeah. into the world. Yeah, and sharing a similar faith uh, as well. So both have been gifted with children. I think, uh, yes, I think it's the understanding. I love the little, the, the slight head tilt, um, and they're really interlocking, the, 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 the eyes are interlocking, they're really looking at each other. It's still so perfect. I mean, you look at that and you think it was created yesterday, and it's the way it glows, and I mean, obviously we're seeing a, see, seeing a copy of it, but there's no imperfections, and this is so long ago that he created it. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. I think that's the beauty of it, too, yes. And then if you think, I mean, this has been inside, but many of the rondelles are outside, and they have been outside for 500 years, and rain and storm and hail, and they are still beautiful. I guess what I, I wasn't as struck by it from the side view, but I really like the view that Elizabeth would be saying of Mary, that you had not other one earlier. That yeah. I mean, she looks young. She looks a bit overwhelmed. So I really think that's a spectacular view of her face, the way that Elizabeth would see Mary. So mm -hmm. that I think is very striking. And I think she has her lips parted a little bit. I think they're they're communicating. Um, you know, it, it's extraordinary to think that these two women were so connected in the sense they were related. Both of them would have a son. Both of their sons would be murdered. And that this was the beginning of you know, a fundamental change in humankind. The expression on uh, her face, it re I'm not sure I've got the words right, but apparently uh, it was written that uh, she said, Elizabeth said to Mary, who am I that the mother of my Lord comes, I think comes to Come see to me. me. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like she's asking a question. Right. Getting ready to ask a question. I, I just keep the, the expression on her face is beautiful. Yeah. And so this sculpture was included in a large American exhibition of many works of the Della Rubia workshop. Um, it was in uh, 2016 going into 2017 and it was at the Museum of Fine Art in Boston and also at the National Gallery in um, Washington and when they organized this exhibition the curator 
had the idea, she wanted to bring this in because it's such a special piece. Um, and she wasn't sure if the church would let it go, but then they picked up the phone and it was almost like, oh sure you can have it. And so it was, sometimes it's interesting in our lives too, we, we, we want something and we, we think about it, or go over it so many times in our head and um, we think, oh, it's never gonna happen. But sometimes if we ask, we will get. So I thought that was just a, an interesting part. In, in my mind, I, I thought um, Mary knew she was the mother of God, but did not stop, it did not stop her to set out and went with haste to see Elizabeth. She willingly cared and served Elizabeth with a kind heart. All of this most moving message is reflected in Della Rubio's sculpture. Now, will you leave you with a question? Do I relate to people with true kindness and compassion, as we can see it here in this sculpture? And now I would like to move on to our third work of art of this evening. It's The Birth of Saint John the Baptist, painted by the leading Spanish Baroque artist, Bartholomé Esteban Murillo in 1655. And it invites us to contemplate the importance of the birth of Saint John the Baptist, who prepared the people for the coming of the Messiah. Murillo was born in Seville, Spain, in 1617, was known as the greatest religious painter of his age. He would live and work in Seville his entire life and was a major artist of the Catholic Counter-Reformation. During his childhood, Seville remained the foremost city in Spain, equal in power and population to Venice, Amsterdam, or even Madrid. Seville had long held the monopole on trading with the New World, and despite Spain's near-constant wars with France and the Low Countries, the city remained prosperous well into the 1630s. By the early 1650s, however, Seville, although still seen as Spain's cosmopolitan intellectual center, was no longer a commercial powerhouse. The city had lost its trade monopole to the port city of Cadiz. Almost half of the city of Seville was wiped out in the plague of 1647 to 1652. A catastrophe followed by famine, recession, and trade rebellion. Partly in reaction to this economic disintegration, Seville's religious orders, Frances Franciscans, Dominicans, and Capuchins, dedicated their considerable resources towards charity and commissioned artworks to both give hope to the populace and artistically reinforce the Counter-Reformation. Murillo, who was deeply devout, shaped his life and career on service to the Catholic Church and its fraternities, many of which are still active today. Unlike the somewhat earlier generation of master Spanish painters, including Diego Velasquez, Francesco de Zuberan, and Alonso Cano, Murillo did not aspire to royal patronage. His connections to civil aristocracy and religious brotherhoods were enough to facilitate a flow of commissions. Murillo also painted sensitive portraits of the local street life in Seville that offered an alternative strand to his impressive religious oeuvre. He died aged 65 in 1682 resulting from a fall from a scaffolding while painting a fresco in the Capuchin church in Cadiz. As we consider tonight's third and last painting, I would like to quote Luke chapter one, verses 57 
63 and 64. I quote, now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. Zacharias asked for a writing table and wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue free and he began to speak praising God. The end of quote. With this, um, we come to our last round of interpretation, reflection, thoughts. Um, and yeah, what do we see? Who are the figures? What's kind of the, the feeling? Um, we have, this is a Baroque painting, so we have a lot of chiaroscuro, um, very dark, and just the kind of the figures kind of um, shine out, so the light and dark contrast. Um. So Anyone? Zacharias, Any? kind of in the dark. The right, Zacharias, we can, again, the, it's, it's e I think it's almost easy to see it on the, the printout ah. and sometimes on, on my screen. So yeah, Zacharias ah. is over here, very much in the dark. And in the bed is so I kind of, yeah, so I kind of, so um, really would kind of like doing that, putting kind of almost two scenes into one painting. So in the, in the background here, um, this is Elizabeth being looked after by a nurse after she has given birth to John the Baptist. Um, so it's just kind of to implement, to keep her in the picture. <laughs> Yeah, so but we have John here. And actually, yeah. So something that I'm noticing is that, unlike the other two pieces of art, here the, the women are dressed like in the 17th century. They're not trying to emulate what was like long tunics of the 2000 years ago. Is that something specific of the style? Mm -hmm. that trying to make it more relatable to the populace that you were referring to, perhaps? Exactly. So um, uh, many artists in the Baroque would dress their figures in contemporary um, dress and not to emulate it's kind of what happened earlier. Um, and I think particularly the Spanish artists kind of liked us to be very close to the people that looked at the painting to put the, that, those people into the paintings as well. Yeah. So we, you have um, ordinary people right, looking after Saint John the Baptist. So. I just find it interesting how many, how busy it is <laughs> compared to the images of the nativity we usually see. This. There were probably people helping, maybe, but the usually nativity is very empty. You just have the, the three main characters, sometimes the animals, but not much. It's interesting to see how normal it looks, if I can say, as a birth. You, you'd think people would come over to help the mom, and the, like, especially at that time, probably. But it's interesting to see how active and and uh, yeah, how normal it is in contrast to what the birth of his cousin and a few months later yeah i don't know it yeah. doesn't know, add much but no it's a it's a nice observation in particular in the in the gospel reading it talks about that the neighbors were kind of ini initially concerned and they kind of come over and i think um and also maybe respecting the aging elizabeth a little bit more i mean she might be someone who needs a bit more help uh in a situation like that i think it's a, it's a very nice um, thought to be particularly thoughtful of the, the older um, mother. Yeah. And kind of since you were talking about the light earlier, and I think this is more in a contrast of to the first painting by Blake, which we saw. I mean, we have dazzling white right in the middle, isn't it? So um, St. John the Baptist himself is one of the main light sources right in the middle of the painting. And he sh shines 
on all the faces that are right around him. Um, and then we have a, another light source coming, a heavenly light coming from the group of angels um, that are kind of peering through the heavens to see what's, what's going on um, down there. And also that close, I mean, I think it's so St. John itself and, and also the, the clothes are just, I mean, there's no other word than dazzling white um, that was, was used. And again, it's, it's probably a re reference to purity um, that, because he was considered one of the two other people in the Bible that are considered to have been received without original sin. Um, so besides Mary and Christ. And, and that's something that I've learned that, um, so we celebrate St. John's birthday. And then again, he's one of the only three in the church calendar that we celebrate the, the birthday of. So it's, it's Mary's birthday, Christ's birthday, and St. John the Baptist's birthday, which falls on June the 24th. So again, kind of the play with, um, I think, the, the birth of Christ. I'm just so struck by the composition. You're, I just find that I'm compelled to look at the baby and certainly the color and just the central positioning, but all the axes are going toward the child. I mean, the obvious one is the cherub's right. fingertip, but even like that edge of the towel that the person next, you know, to uh -huh. that, that edge goes right to the baby. The edge of the blanket and the bed sheet in the background also cuts right there. Y and you're just like, all the forces are pointing mm -hmm. you right there um, beyond the light and just the central position of things. Yes, and that's beautiful. So that's, um, I, uh, a while ago I've, I've given a little introduction about Baroque art. And so um, you would see me drawing lines through the paintings and it's yeah. exactly, so we have, if you draw a line from the eyes of Zacharias, it yeah. would meet St. John, these eyes. And as I say, kind of all the diagonal lines would, would all meet up in, um, on the central point of, of St. John, that's right. Maybe it's the nurse in me, but, and I see it more in my copy, but it almost looks like you have like the bloody cloths from childbirth right, right there. And yeah. it's almost like a foreshadowing of what's gonna happen to St. John in his future, you know, yeah. that he'll be martyred. So at first I thought, gosh, is it just from the blanket? And the more I look at it, I think that's its own separate cloth, you know, from the childbirth experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also, I think it's, it's hard to see as well. So um, there's a little basin down here and the little towel is lying in. So it depicts the, um, the first bath of St. John the Baptist, which has not been, it's not part of the description in the gospel. But again, I think it's kind of foreshadowing he's being the Baptist, so kind of the, the, the use of water and uh, um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's a very subtle um, hint. He was a dog person. <laughs> yeah, <thanks. laughs> little light relief there. <laughs> Do I? Yeah, the, the, I just was struck by the dog too, like why, and, and the cup above the dog, is that supposed to point us or symbolize anything? Say it again, uh, yeah. The, the cup above the dog um, on that table, is oh, that yeah. a symbol for anything, or? Um, I, so this corner, I would say, because it's also kind of, there's a children's, it's a child's chair, there's a puppy on it, I think it kind of, comes al goes along a little bit what we were saying here. He merges a little bit the um, everyday life uh, with the religious scenes to make it relatable. But then also, uh, dogs are actually um, included in, in many works of art. I mean, they're a sign for, for purity, for love, um, companionship. Um, I actually, that, so if you want to keep your children busy in the museum, ask them to point out the dogs in, in, <laughs> in, <laughs> in, in paintings. Um, and you will be surprised how many dogs you actually will find in, in paintings of the Renaissance and the Baroque. I think it's sort of delightful that it shows all these women busy helping and getting the baby ready. 
And then the the father of the baby is just sort of in shadow and isn't really doing much of anything. <laughs> <laughs> but that's sort of funny. <laughs> I guess nothing has changed. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> actually running out of time so yes so um, it was a beautiful exactly all the things um, I think again it's a beautiful painting it's we kind of went from a mute color which and the mute Sycharias um, to through the dazzling white to now the white and and lots of color um, I think it was very and then um, using the humble material of clay to, as we saw in the, in the sculpture, to be able to create something so, so beautiful. And it's the end of our presentation and I will leave you tonight with my last question. Do I truly believe that nothing is impossible for God and that he will keep his promises to us? Thank you very much. <laughs>